Welcome to Urban X Real Talk Fitness Radio, where we bring you more than just the trending news. We bring you the news you need to know, news to assist you in making healthier choices for yourself in the hopes that you will be successful in navigating the often murky waters of the health and fitness industry. I'm your host, Tiaja. We'll be back next week, but as promised, each month, we're going to veer off the beaten path and offer you something just a little bit different. Not sure if you agree with this, but if you don't, it's okay. From my vantage point, there has never been a time, at least in my lifetime, where this country has been so divided. What I find unique about this division is the fact that it's solely based on opinions versus actual events. In the 60s, this country was divided on actual events like civil rights and the Vietnam War. Today, the division is semantic driven and ideological in nature. So, so what? Isn't this supposed to be a podcast about health, you say? Well, it is. But since our philosophy is health is wholeness, we attempt to train the whole person, not just the sum of their parts. The fitness between your ears is just as pertinent as the amount of weight you can press. So there are those who argue rather loudly for the separation of health and politics, that health isn't political, but it is. From the foods we eat to what health care provider we choose to climate change, like it or not, the war against your health is political, and yes, it's a war. A war of attrition, if nothing else. Therefore, it's not enough to get involved, you must become evolved. Now, what do I mean by becoming evolved? You're going to have to make up your mind to take full charge and accountability for your own health or live on the margins of disease. Now, I want you to take a listen to an interview I borrowed from the TFP student organization with a scientist named Mark Morano. Mr. Morano is a best-selling author. His book titled The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change is extremely controversial. You can tell by the title alone. In fact, many of his colleagues in the science community refuse to give him a seat at the table of esteemed academia which is to say they refuse to peer review his work for fear of offering legitimacy to it. For that reason alone, I want you to take a listen for yourself and decide if you believe what he is saying is true. The entire interview is over one hour long, so I'll play just a portion of it. If you like to listen to it in its entirety, and I strongly recommend you do, I'll leave a link in the description. I'll be back with my two cents a bit later. It is Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019. Let's flow. when you question global warming. Mark Morano, author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, has first-hand experience. National Geographic accused him of being a top-tier climate denier. U.S. Weekly Magazine said his research infuriates Hollywood, and wanted posters went up in Paris when he attended the U.N. Climate Summit. This interview with Mark Morano will tell you what the green socialist left doesn't want you to know. So how did you get involved in this fight and what motivates you to continue? Interesting question, thank you. Um, I got involved because I was always sort of a conservative Republican except when it came to environmental issues. I was essentially indoctrinated uh, as a kid and I'm talking from like age 12 through maybe 22 on environmental issues. I didn't like President uh, Reagan's interior secretary because he was putting in roads in the forests and uh, he was harming the trees. And I was always worried about species extinction. I was worried about the Amazon rainforest. Bought it hook, line and sinker. But what happened was uh, I read reading the works of Dixie Lee Ray, the former nuclear physicist, and actually specifically on the Amazon, she is saying it's the least endangered forest that the trees regenerate. I was so shocked when I first heard this, this would have been about 1990, the Rio Earth Summit, which would have been 1992, that I started investigating that. And I started looking into the whole environmental movement, culminating in actually doing a documentary on the Amazon rainforest. So the realization that I had been conned on many of these environmental issues is what turned me, so by the time I was started to focus on climate, I was already skeptical of it. So I started investigating the, the climate movement and I was just, it was amazing to me how 
essentially big science, universities, the media, academia, and institutions like the United Nations and others were just promoting this almost as a lobbying perspective, as a campaign cause. And when I started talking to scientists and uh, interviewing scientists, it quickly became, essentially became my focus of work uh, as an investigative journalist and then later working in the United States Senate. I think a lot of college students are in that position where they feel like they need to subscribe to climate change and the, the agenda that's behind it. Um, could you say a word about the ideology that's behind the climate change uh, hype? Let's start with a bumper sticker philosophy. I saw a bumper sticker today. Big science is not a liberal conspiracy. Oh, yes, it is. Or yes, it can be. And much of it is. And here's what I mean by that. And here's why that bumper sticker is wrong. When the regulatory state, i.e., the uh, environmental protection agencies, the United Nations, the U.S. federal government, when they want to regulate, they look for justifications and causes. And that's the natural state of any government. So essentially, what they've done, and if you go back to the beginning of the, of the environmental movement, of the modern environmental movement in the 1960s, they've used every environmental scare from overpopulation to resource scarcity to threat of famine to deforestation to global cooling uh, as an excuse to increase the regulatory powers of the state. In other words, we're facing overpopulation, we're facing global cooling, we need to redistribute wealth, we need sovereignty limiting, limiting treaties, we need more central planning, we need less freedom, less capitalism. I actually point that out in my book. So the motivating factor between climate change and, the, and what's going on today is global warming is merely the latest environmental scare with the exact same solutions going back 50 years. In other words, it doesn't really matter what the science of global warming. They actually have quotes. Their main figures say that. The EU climate commissioner said, even if we're wrong on the science, we're doing the right thing by policy. What is that policy? The UN climate chief explicitly stated, and I interviewed her on this, we seek a centralized transformation that will make life on planet Earth very different for everyone. That's the UN climate chief's explicit goal. Her assistant, a guy named Edenhofer, actually said, we will redistribute wealth by climate policy. This is not even about environmental policy anymore. They're openly talking about it. They talk about global governance. They talk about uh, CO2 budgets for every man, woman, and child on the planet. This is their goal, and global warming is merely the latest scare. You can go back, and I do go back in the book. Global cooling had the exact same solutions. It's always the intervention and the, the increasing the power of the regulatory state. That is why we're hearing about global warming. We're not hearing about global warming because of temperature or storms or polar bears. It's because they're seeking a justification. They don't want to argue on the merits their policies. In other words, the Green New Deal, they just admitted IOC's chief of staff said this was never about the climate. This was a, uh, a, a increase the government kind of thing, a change the whole economy type of thing. Her, uh, former chief of staff, uh, campaign manager, actually said a similar thing, that this was actually not about the climate. They're openly admitting that. They don't want to argue their points on the merit. Instead, so they use subterfuge. We only have 12 years left. We're facing a climate emergency as cities and colleges are now comically declaring that across the, the world. Uh, so they don't, have to, they don't have to deal with that. That's how global warming becomes part of the agenda tool for the regulatory state. Now, in practical terms, if we followed all the demands of the environmental movement, what impact would that have on the lives of everyday Americans? First, let me answer your question by saying, assuming we actually faced a climate emergency, we would all be doomed if we had to rely on the EPA and the United Nations uh, or the Green New Deal to save us. Now, before we even talk about the economic and social and, and, and development impacts, it's very simple. Even if, we, if every country promised what they did in the UN Paris Climate Agreement that everyone hailed as saving the earth, John Kerry signed with his two-year-old granddaughter on his lap because he was signing for the future, saving the planet, it would delay the temperature. Assuming you believe the UN science, which you should not in any way, shape, or form believe, it would delay the temperature by you know, a few months, the temperature 100 years from now by a few months. It would not be detectable on any measure, even if they were right on the science and everyone complied. In other words, it's completely scientifically meaningless. Green New Deal, same thing. Using the EPA's own models, it would have no impact on the climate. Zero. Wouldn't even impact global emissions, let alone possibility of temperature or storm. So we start out by saying 
these are all symbolism, and they will admit that there's nothing they're proposing which would have any impact. In fact, one of the quotes I have is an Ivy League scientist who says, uh, the, the policies prescribed, no policies proposed as of yet would have any impact on the climate if in fact the climate was controlled by CO2. It's all window dressing. Having said that, they will have huge impacts. The UN Paris Agreement, most expensive treaty in world history. The Green New Deal estimates up to 94, 93 or four trillion dollars. Uh, hammering families with unnecessary energy costs. We have uh, gas tax proposals, 50 cents a gallon. Would you rather have bad storms or pay 50 cents a gallon? I'm sorry. So if we all agree to pay 50 cents a gallon, we're going to get less hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and droughts. What era are we living in? They're essentially saying your SUV controls the weather the same as your car controls it. So it's a way to transform the economy massive wealth redistribution, massive central planning, with literally bean counters affecting every aspect of your life. And I say that because the UN chief has actually said, we need to treat meat eaters the same way we treat smokers and relegate them to a section of a restaurant or outside or ban it completely. We need to uh, stop gas powered cars, ban that, make them all electric, despite the fact that electric uses all sorts of rare earth minerals that you need massive amounts of fossil fuels to get and battery technology and they're no more earth friendly. We need to affect our diet, agriculture, they're going after cows, they're going after your appliances, Energy Star, uh, Department of Energy, every aspect of your life, your washing machines, your dishwashers, less efficient, less powerful, more efficient, but less powerful than they were 15 years ago. Low end appliances 15 years ago outperform high end ones today because the government is slowly choking the life out of everything and making them less and less powerful, all in the name of saving the planet. Same thing with cars. The SUV has been statutorily killed and the Trump administration is trying to save it, but it looks like we're looking at 54 and a half miles per gallon coming up in a few years. Automakers are going along. It's just cars, they're, they're every tentacle you can imagine, they're reaching into our life. There's talks about controlling thermostats, uh, CO2 budgets, uh, Carbon ration cards from your employers have been proposed in Europe where your employer monitors your train, airline, home energy use. So it's just that it's a level of control we've never even contemplated. That's the future of this regulation. And it's all in the name of saving the planet, going green, also deals with population issues. Al Gore actually said China will have more population. I'm sorry, Africa will have more than China and India combined in the next century later this century, by 2050. And he said, we need ubiquitous fertility management to fight it. This is a white, wealthy Western politician suggesting that there's going to be too many Africans in 50 to 100 years from now, and we need to do something about it. And this is what we're facing. This is, you know, as Patrick Moore, the co-founder of Greenpeace, who turned against the organization, said, the modern environmental movement is the most anti-human uh, movement today on Earth. And I interviewed Vaclav Klaus, the former Czech president of the uh, Czech Republic, uh, former Czechoslovakia. And he said, having grown up under communism, the greatest threat we face today is what he calls ambitious environmentalism. And he directly compares the whole quest, the whole way that you know, Lysenkoism, the whole way this, the Soviet system did it with all the science that had to support the policies and you couldn't dissent and you had to go along and dissenters would be jailed. All that's happening today. We have a U.S. Senator calling for RICO statutes against climate skeptics. We have Bill Nye, the science guy, supporting it, open, open to the idea of jailing skeptics for affecting his quality of life. This is what the state of where we are right now. And this is what college kids, this is what children are being taught, that there's no dissent, that we must do this, that the Earth's in great peril, when the opposite is true. I mean, the Earth, there's absolutely nothing unusual going on with the climate, and I'd be happy to talk about that as well. I heard that even showers are gonna be restricted. Uh, yes, there's, there's a whole movement. Actually, Al Gore's, uh, was his live Earth concerts. He was handing out brochures about taking baths together, saving the bathwater, riding your bike to work. Al Gore, meanwhile, all these celebrities up there living outrageous lifestyles of you know, massive carbon footprints. We see this every day, whether it's uh, you know, Al Gore or Leonardo DiCaprio. But at the same time, they're talking about severe restrictions on people's life. And it's not just affecting you know, showers, but it's, we're talking about your transportation, your home energy use. We're talking about 
every, in fact, Nancy Pelosi went to China in 2009 and said, we need a complete inventory on every aspect of our lives in order to fight global warming. The Japanese government actually said we need to go to bed an hour earlier in order to fight global warming. The theory being at night, you have a high def TV on, you're using more power, and that if you sleep more at night and, and you're only awake during the day, you'll use less energy. This is where we're coming because there's a climate emergency, don't you know? And so they have to be able, they have the justification to regulate it. And so Sadly, Republicans, even the Trump administration, no one is articulating any case against it. In fact, our whole flaw, the, the reason I'm, I, I, don't, I, I sometimes lose optimism about this, this battle, you have one side saying, we, we, all scientists agree, which is completely bogus. In fact, I have a whole chapter on that in my book. In fact, it's called pulled from thin air, 97% consensus. But you have one side saying all scientists agree, we face a climate emergency, we only have 10, 12 years, 100 months, you know, whatever the four years, whatever the moment they come up with. And the other side says, well, it costs too much. Well, we can't really do that. Well, I'm not gonna touch the science. Well, you know, that's a lot of money. Well, we and then we'll do the Green New Deal light. We have a whole contingent of Mitt Romney and other Republicans in the House coming up with a new Green Deal light. Like, well, we must, we can't go that far, but we have to do something. You know, this is a crisis. So what ends up happening is you have one side who never gets refuted officially. And what I mean by officially is, yeah, you can have a lot of scientists, you can have a lot of people, but no one in position of government power, other than President Donald Trump himself, is the only one, no cabinet members, will actually speak up on the premise, the scientific premise and the garbage that comes out of the United Nations and the National Climate Assessment what does the public hear? The public hears no dissent. They hear the media, they hear academia, they hear the United Nations, and they hear all these other people afraid to speak as though it's all true. So in a very important way, Trump administration is doing damage to the public perception on climate change because if the most skeptical administration in, in history of Washington on climate can't push back on the science, the science must be solid. That's what's so sad about this. They've been intimidated. There's a, another thing I wanted to ask you, and you mentioned this in your book, and that is how some scientists focus on reducing the population, the human yes. race. It's a very radical thing. Um, and I wonder if, there's a, if you see a connection between the radical uh, push to reduce the population on Earth and Planned Parenthood's agenda to, uh, to basically kill unborn children. Yes, and, and I, the aforementioned interview, Al Gore at a Bill Gates event said, Africa's gonna have too many people, we need fertility management. That's where Planned Parenthood comes in. They're great at fertility management, code words. Um, when you have the population scare like we have now, we have advisors to Pope Francis uh, who believe that the carrying capacity of the earth is only about one, you know, one billion people. In other words, let's wipe out six, seven billion people because the earth can't handle any more than that. And these are people that have gone to the Vatican, I went, I went to a Vatican climate summit and I was threatened to be removed by United Nations security. It was a Pope papal meeting at the Vatican with UN uh, officials, where they're basically the Vatican married itself to the UN climate agenda. And at this agenda, they had the, the, some of the biggest promoters Planned Parenthood, population control, people like Jeffrey Sachs. I called it an unholy alliance with what Pope Francis did. Uh, and it's, it's sad because these, these advisors, these people were given great credibility. They're tied in with the United Nations. This is behind the agenda. When you look at the developing world, one of their goals is to limit their population. These poor countries where people are using you know, animal plows to, for agriculture, they're doing it right because they're farming and they're cultivating the earth. Meanwhile, they're living in huts of dung, they're breathing in uh, all, all the soot and horrible uh, air quality from that. They're polluting their rivers with feces. They have no infrastructure. They have no sewage, modern sanitation, no hospitals, no modern dentistry, high infant mortality. Uh, in my sequel, I'm actually interview, at, at interviewing, but I'm featuring the MTV show Trippin' with, with uh, uh, Drew Barrymore and uh, a couple other actresses who go to these third world hell holes, and that's a politically incorrect term now. You're supposed to say the developing world. Uh, and they praise these countries for being earth friendly and for not having development. Well, I did an analysis and showed that you know, the highest infant mortality rates were in the countries they were promoting. This is their agenda. They, they actually believe that keeping people at a subsistence level is moral and it's a, it's a great way to go forward. And that's what the policies are designed to do. President Obama, one of the, his legacies was preventing 
modern energy coal plants being built in Africa, which would have brought running water, electricity to over a billion people throughout the world. When they don't seem to be uh, progressing in one avenue, they just reinvent themselves. Is that why the term global warming became climate change? Yes. In fact, they only reinvent themselves. We have uh, people like Steven Snyder who in the 1970s were featured in documentaries in, in search of Leonard Nimoy, warning of global cooling. They flipped sides within 10 years. You could find, I actually was tracing the evolution. Some of the same scientists at NASA, they'd flip sides, go from global warming alarmist, global cooling alarmist to a global warming alarmist. But absolutely, they, they, they use whatever they think will work. And one of the things, the key switch, you mentioned the climate change, I was at a UN summit in Bali and it was a John McCain aid. Now this was 2007. John McCain was co-sponsoring climate bills at the time. His top aide told me that they were gonna start blaming weather events on climate. And I was laughing at him saying, no one's gonna buy that, that's absurd. The earth, you know, there's no way you're gonna be able to link storms, there's no trend. Turns out that's what they did. It used to be global warming. In fact, Al Gore's first film was all about global warming and then it switches to climate change. And that word, I remember even when I was in the Senate back in 2006 and seven, when they were using the word global warming, environmentalists were mad that they were still using that word and the switchover was going to climate change because they wanted something broader. Because at that point, we had an almost 20 year no change in temperature. So it was hard to claim global warming when the temperature wasn't going up every year. So they changed it to climate change. Now, everything is evidence. Hey. You know, you're, uh, you know, there's a storm in uh, Europe, oh, climate change. There's a heat wave in Australia, oh, climate change. There's a blizzard in the East Coast, oh, that's climate change. My favorite was Al Gore claiming that, you know, uh, this is what global warming looks like. And the pages of the New York Times, they started arguing that record cold and snow were now a consequence of global warming because, because it was extreme weather. And there's a whole history of this, and there's other, other phrases people have tried to use, like global climate disruption, global weirding. But the new phrase, and Barbara Streisand and um, Michael Oppenheimer, you and I'm sorry, Al Gore himself gets gets a uh, plug for this, is climate emergency, and this is the one that's spreading newspapers, uh, Telemundo, the UK Guardian, universities, towns, state. They're going to start declaring climate emergencies because they think if people hear that word, they'll have to act. They won't want to. You know, we don't have time to debate the Green New Deal. We need to pass a climate emergency. Medieval warm period was from 900 to about 1300 A.D. Then you had the Roman warming period around zero A.D. Peer-reviewed studies, geologic records, and all the all the, all the uh, studies have shown that we have actually. Um, cooled since the Roman warming period and likely since the medieval warming period to current. In other words, we were up here warm in the Roman warming period, then we cooled a little bit, then we warmed in the medieval warm period, then we went to a little ice age and now we're back up. Not quite where we were in the medieval warm period. The first United Nations climate report, 1990, showed a massive medieval warm period and then it goes down and we still weren't at that same temperature. That was untenable. So what happened? We actually had the scientists testify in the United States Senate. He got a call from a colleague who said, we have to get rid of the medieval warm period. These were UN affiliated academic scientists. Guess what? By year 2000, they got rid of the medieval warm period. They erased it. They went back and they said, you know, we've looked at everything and it no longer existed. They showed a flat line and then the 20th century, a big hockey stick. That's what they did. And then I have a whole chapter devoted into my book on the con that was erasing the past, but they've done it before. Skeptics, climate skeptics made hay out of the eight, almost 20 year pause in global warming. What does the federal government do? NOAA scientists, tired of this, they're sick of it. They have satellite data, land, a, this, the temperature's not going up. They're frustrated, they're angry, it's ruining. Right before the UN Paris Agreement in November 2015, in 2015, NOAA, federal agency, scientists comes out, they called it the pause buster study. They said, you know what? We've redone the numbers. We've looked at the past. We did it wrong. And here's the new data. There was no global warming pause. They erased it. They said they have new numbers, new figures. This would be like a company losing money, getting investigations, sued by investors. And the company says, well, we hired a new accountant. And guess what? We made record profits. All those old people saying we lost money, not true. That's what they did. And so this study comes out, erases the past, the, the climate pause, was gone, no longer existed. This was compared to George Orwell, uh, 1984 tactics. It didn't matter. Obama went to the UN Paris Agreement with the big news that his own federal agency, there's now no pause in global warming. Global warming continues to accelerate. This will silence the skeptics, blah, blah, blah. This is what they do. And you know, not only have they done it there, but they've done repeatedly that 
it's all malleable. You know, they can change what they need to. And go back to the bumper sticker. Science is not a liberal conspiracy. Oh yes, it can be. Now here are my two cents and feel free to keep the change. Why should we trust our leaders? Let's see. Hmm. There is an obesity, diabetes, and overall health crisis in America. Yet, the debate is over health care, not health. Why? Aren't these the same politicians, federal agencies, and bureaucrats who advised the public only a few years back that opioids were non-addictive? Who changed the conversation from global warming to global cooling to a, a mini ice age to climate change, now climate emergency? We have high school and college students losing friends on account of them disagreeing over climate change. One student sadly wrote, My roommate unfriended me just because he saw I liked an Instagram post that simply pointed out decades of these fear-mongering propaganda like the world is going to end in X amount of years if we don't address global cooling, global warming, climate change. Unfriended her just because she liked a post? See, the same thing is happening with corporate America. We have corporate executives combing over a person's social media history just to find an objectionable tweet or Facebook like over something they may philosophically disagree with. This is insanity, you guys. There's no need to talk about health care if we continue to ostracize people, pushing them towards the fringe of emotional and mental disorders like stress, feelings of isolation, depression, and suicide. Yes, we too are complicit in this abysmal health mortality statistics of our fellow Americans. You have family members you won't talk to because they won't agree with your political views or your moral beliefs. You have family members who are homeless because you've disowned them for the reason that they have an addiction to drugs, yet your medicine cabinet is full of pharmaceutical drugs. See, we are doing this to each other. But there is a group, a cabal, if you will, that continue to profit off of our infighting and subsequent disease. Look, believe what you want to believe, but don't be a hypocrite. Allow others the time, space, and right to do the same. There is truly nothing news under the sun. Walk in health and